Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I am, uh, I am Raya Marina Stefan. I am board member of IWRA and I'm the deputy editor in chief of its journal Water International. Today, I have the pleasure to moderate with my colleague Asma Bashir the second session related to the first topic, subtopic of our online conference, the subtopic related to how can we better manage water for food and public health in a changing world. Uh, we have a panel of uh, seven, uh, seven speakers, and I uh, hope you will find all of them interesting. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker who, who is joining us from Botswana. So, um, uh, excuse me, I took the wrong program. Uh, so, Ms. Kennedy uh, will talk to us about the sustainable development, a strategic approach to sustainable business practices in, in the Francis Town region in Botswana. Uh, uh, Ms. Dick, your, the floor is yours. Please keep your time of 10 minutes. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to make a presentation to you on my study on sustainable development, a strategic approach for sustainable business practices in Francis Town region in Botswana. This is a study that is that is that I conducted for my for the requirements of a doctor of business administration with the online university of UNICAF and it is being supervised by Dr. Pascal Hardy. Um, I've already mentioned that the study is on the sustainable development a theory that was uh, that emerged for the first time in 1972 at the United Conference on Human and Environment in Stockholm. The theory took its shape in 1987 uh, through the World Commission Environment and Development Report, which is commonly known as our Common Future in 1987. Then in 1992, the international world accepted the, adopted the Agenda 21 on sustainable development at Rio de Janeiro in, in Brussels. And then we saw the Millennium Development Goals in the year 2000, and they expired in the year 2015, and they were re replaced by the, by the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that are actually now leading the whole world to the SD Agenda of uh, 2030. Uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals are the blueprint to the Agenda 2030. And these development goals are a guide to actually help the whole world on how to look after the environment or use the resources in a way that they will also benefit the people that will come after our generation. Now, what was the problem that uh, uh, led to this study? Uh, we are uh, currently experiencing a problem as a nation, and that is due to uh, wastewater discharge facilities that are not complying with the requirements of wastewater discharge as per the Botswana standard, um, BOS 93, 2012. The results here show that uh, from 2013 up to around 2019, we were actually experiencing uh, facilities that are not in compliance with the wastewater discharge requirements. And this became a problem that we, is a, we, we need a solution as to how we can actually um, solve this problem in such a way that we can curb these pollution problems. Now, the, the study was uh, then conducted and the study is a qualitative case study that is actually looking at um, what is the business or what is the industry doing in terms of the SD principles? What initiatives have they taken into practice in order to, 
to, to, to, to, to help them to improve their businesses. So the study is actually uh, focused on the trade effluent generating industries. Why? Because the trade effluence, they've got a stronger strength, which we believe that because when they are actually uh, being discharged into the, the, the sewer line, they affect the, the, the performance of the wastewater treatment facilities. Hence, we start to have these pollution issues. And we believe that um, if pollution can be prevented and controlled at industry level, it will actually protect the environment as well as the water resources. And at the same time, we'll be able to advance the SD theory and also advance the aspirations of the uh, Agenda 2030. Now, what was the methodology? The methodology that we used was that uh, we used the research questions that were developed to explore the topic. Um, that included the open-ended interview questions being developed based on the research questions. Then semi-structured interviews were conducted at the three selected industries. 28 out of 30 research participants were interviewed and data was collected. And this data was actually augmented with document reviews for trustworthiness and rigor. Now, the results of the, of the study. Uh, as I've already indicated that um, this is a study that is collecting data in terms of words and transcripts were actually produced out of the interviews. And these transcripts were then data coded using the hand data coding. And three levels of data coding were, were, were used, where level one of data coding produced more than a thousand data codes. And these data codes were then actually grouped together into categories to actually um, refocus them and also to merge those uh, codes that were, 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 were similar. And then we also then moved on to level three data coding. Level three data coding where the categories were then also um, merged together based on their similarities to actually come up with themes that were answering the, the, the research questions. And it was found from the results of this study that um, the industry actually has not really appreciated that much, or they are not able to implement the triple bottom line framework, which, is, which will actually help them to balance the profits with the environmental protection and the, the, the social development. It's something that the industry still needs to uptake in order to be able to, inter to weave the sustainable development principles within their practices, right from the strategic levels to the operations. We also found that, that um, there is need for improvement in leadership and governance to embrace the changes that are happening in the environment and in the technologies to be able to embrace um, issues like the sustainable development principles. And also there is need to actually improve in the systems and processes so that the pollution can actually be reduced at the level of the industry. There's also need for stakeholder engagement and innovation to be able to resolve issues of pollution right there at the industry level. And we also found that along with this, there are some challenges and opportunities because pollution for instance, is not a respecter of borders, which means that the products that are being produced at these industries, they are being exported to the international markets. And it is a competitive advantage when the industry itself is actually um, managing pollution or they are selling products that are considered as green products. And there are challenges that uh, the industries are facing, especially in the developing world where there are no uh, human capacities and also issues of financial capacity. And also Botswana is a, is a landlocked country. And as such, you find that transportation, both of raw material and finished goods is very, very expensive for, for the industry. And then because of that, you find that um, they're actually maybe in a way 
compromising the environment as well as the social development of the people. In conclusion, um, the industry has embraced the SD principles, but there is a slow uptake of TBL framework by the industry. And that is due to the fact that um, uh, they, they, they don't have the skill or they haven't really uh, had the chance to practice the SD principles. And then the uptake of the SD principles can actually be enhanced by improving the leadership and governance within these industries and also improving the effectiveness and the efficiency of the systems and the processes, as well as enhancing the stakeholder engagement and innovation. And we found that um, there are challenges and opportunities that they can be derived from the implementation of the SD, especially with regard to being at a competitive advantage due to um, greening of the processes, greening of the goals and the targets and the objectives, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. for your presentation. Um, now we're gonna, next presentation is gonna be done by Andrew Manuba Limantol, who's a lecturer at the School of Sustainable Development, University of Environment and Sustainable Development, Somania, Ghana. He'll be presenting on access to hand washing with soap facility in Bandori. Thank you for the opportunity. I am Andrew Manuba Limantol, as mentioned, and my co-author is Professor uh, Anthony Amon. The title of our research is Access to Hand Washing with Soap Facility in Binduri District, a post sanitization investigation of drivers. Um, the outline will be briefly the introduction, uh, materials and methods, results, discussion, conclusion, and recommendation, and show of some references. Uh, the importance of hand washing with soap and prevention of communicable diseases cannot be overemphasized. And some studies have indicated that it is very key in attaining uh, SDG SIS. But unfortunately, only 19% of the world population wash their hands, especially after visiting toilet, and uh, developing countries are much affected. There have actually been studies in this area, but most of these cities have centered, look at only the healthcare settings and the schools. Uh, that of the house, uh, the household or the community base is yet not, uh, is still not understood. But we know that for hand washing to be sustainable and become part of the people in community, the understanding of the indicators that influence adoption at the household is very important. And this is actually the focus of this thing. We actually look at uh, the post intervention and been doing this and want to understand to I can investigate to know the um, determinant of adoption at the household level. These are some of the uh, examples in the pictures that uh, UNICEF used in implementing that um, initiative at Bendoli District. So the city is in Bendoli District. The district has 177 uh, communities, but they Project, the, the intervention was implemented in 127 communities with a total household of 6,188. And out of that household, we got the, uh, the sample size of uh, 714. We use uh, such as household questionnaire to gather our data. And the, the sample size, as I mentioned, was determined by the online sample size uh, calculated by creative research uh, systems. We use uh, simple random sampling to identify res respondents in each of the communities, and the data was analyzed by SPSS. Here, we ran two regression models, and one first model considered uh, take um, look at controlling the community fixed effects, and that's the result presented in uh, column one and two. And then the second model considered both community fixed effects, and then interviewer fixed effects. And that is presented in column three and four. But the two results were approximately the same. And so I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't waste time on the second. I will just concentrate on the marginal effects uh, statistics for the first 
model. And the variables we look at are uh, those in the uh, left-hand uh, column. We look at the gender. And we realize that the female population, the female households were more inclined to adopting hand washing with soap than the male, uh, their male counterpart. And we also uh, observe from the marginal effect that those who were educated from secondary and above are more uh, likely to own the households uh, like um, washing uh, facilities and use them. We saw that there's a negative uh, relationship between the age and uh, hand washing with soap. And then we introduced a term a square, and then we identified that there was a positive relationship with, the, with, the, with that uh, term and the hand washing with soap. We look at household size and the hand washing. So we identified that the smaller the household size, it was better. Uh, they had, that had a, a, a very good relationship with uh, hand washing with soap. And the societal status or responsibility of household uh, heads, we identified as household heads who has some form of responsibility in the community adapt well or um, more responsive to um, hand washing with soap than their counterpart. And then we had a we look at occupation and we saw that household heads who had occupation adapted to hand washing with soap than uh, those who didn't have occupation. So previous studies had spat out that when it comes to public health concerns and good health practices, the women were always responsive than men. Uh, so they adapted possibly and they were eager to. Uh, adopt such uh, changes. And so we try to look at gender in that case. And then we saw um, or we confirm we, that this is actually the reason. Females were more uh, prone, were more likely to have access to hand washing soap and use it than their male counterpart. And uh, we also realized that the old, those who are grown, the older people, were relatively more likely to um, adapt to hand washing with soap. And some of this may be their experience of health complications. And sometimes, probably they have more time. They are not engaged so much with economic activities. They have a little time and they are, they are, their health is actually their concern. And so this could be the result. It is actually the reason when you go to community like so in the pictures, during the sensitization, when you call them, you find that it's only women or some of the elder men attending such meetings. So with the grown up, uh, we talk about the old, older households adapting well. We wanted to look at the 10 point, turning points and we identified that households heads who were 52 years and above were more likely to adapt uh, to one wasn't better than the others. And as I indicated, the household, uh, the household side influencing the adaptation of hand washing soap, it is not something as it is as we did, where you have bigger household size. Everybody thinks someone will do it, and no one does it when they have to do something in common. And that could be the reason the smaller household side have cooperative uh, ideas and could be able to do, uh, adapt. Studies have also shown that um, those who have purchasing power are more likely to adapt to issues that are more important for their health. And so it would not be surprising that those who have occupation in those communities were more um, adapting to the hand washing soap than the rest. In form of com conclusion, we think a future community led uh, promotion of hand washing soap, like done by UNICEF, could be more successful if it targets the female or people with uh, age 50 plus, and that will be more uh, positive or more helpful for uh, achieving 100% uh, coverage.
but it will be more interesting to add to find out or study to be carried out to understand the factors influencing those less than that age. Why? Uh, what are the issues? What are the factors influencing they are not adapting to the household? So these are some of the references of the city. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for this informative uh, presentation. I'd like to remind the attendees and participants once again to send your uh, questions through the Q&A box. Um, and our next speaker uh, is coming from Turkey. And um, I'd like to ask Ms. Nilsu uh, uh, Cevraksioglu, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, uh, no uh, <laughs> to take the floor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm Ms. Gerekciolu. Uh, I would like to talk to you today about receiving water quality uh, for estimation of total maximum daily uh, pollutant loss in Küçük Menderes River Basin in Turkey. First uh, of all, I will begin by motivation our study. Um, the concentration of conventional purity and specific pollutants are important according to the Europe Water Framework Directive. In order to maintain these amount of quality standards uh, for the entire river basin, laws must be controlled. Uh, mathematical water quality models are important uh, tools to estimate the capacity of watershed to sustain amount of quality standards. In this study, a Quatox water quality model uh, supported by field data to determine uh, the impact of wastewater discharge um, and diffuse uh, source uh, pollution on river water quality was set up. And then time variable nitrogen, phosphorus, organic matter, PCB and heavy metal concentrations in river water quality were stimulated. Finally, the total maximum daily loss of the receiving water body was estimated. As seen on the map, uh, the area in which a red frame uh, shows the Küçük Menderes River sub-basin. This basin is located in Aegean region, Western Turkey. Also, hydrologic features uh, often the basin uh, were shown beside the map. Uh, river water quality in the basin is under significant environmental stress due to agriculture, animal husbandry, and wastewater discharge. About 77% of the wastewater is discharged from treatment plants while the remainder is being released directly from the sewage system. Uh, as mentioned before, the Aquatox model was used in the study. Aquatox can stimulate um, process related with the fate and transport of conventional water products, nutrients, sediments, and toxic chemicals. Um, before uh, the Aquatox model setup, the uh, study started with the determination of the segments. So the Küçük Menderes River uh, Basin was divided into 55 segments. Uh, at the same time, as basin size and the number of point sources make it difficult to use a single model, uh, the study areas is divided into five models, five sub models. Uh, six setup a step was uh, followed uh, in the study. The first step was the calculation of flow between model segments. Uh, an approach based on water balance was used in the calculation of flows uh, between segments. Uh, transient segment uh, volumes were obtained using measured water depths and stream widths. Uh, field flow measurements were used as boundary conditions. The graph uh, shows segments volume and uh, flow data of submodel one. Uh, in the right graph, it's seen that the flow rates are higher in the segments in winter and spring, uh, spring compared to the other season, the same results uh, uh, is seen in the graph of segment volumes. In the basin, nine municipal wastewater treatment plants and one direct discharge and 20 industrial uh, wastewater discharge are located. And non point source laws uh, determined in the Küçük Mendes River Basin Management Plan were used as inputs in the model. Before running the model simulation, the model was set between December 2018 and December 2019, representing one year uh, as a daily step, uh, time step to calculate concentration for the receiving rivers. First, hydraulic data were ent entered into the model. Uh, after uh, the hydraulic structure of the model was established, boundary conditions, point and non point sources, uh, uh, source values uh, were entered into the model. 
Uh, and stimulated water quality variables, uh, nitrogen species, phosphate, salt oxygen, total organic carbon, PCB, and heavy metal as aluminum, cobalt, and copper. In the study, the effect of model parameters was examined with sensitive analysis. The effects of point and non-point source laws on the model were examined in order not to complicate the uh, analysis due to the high number of laws defined. The model parameters were divided into two groups according to 50% and 30% uh, reduction or increase in the sensitive analysis. Uh, examples for graphs of sensitive analysis are given below. Red bars pilot results in which the um, parameter has been reduced by the given percent and blue bars pilot results in which the parameter has been increased. In the study, calibration was made according to the water quality results observed for six periods in 24 monitoring stations. Uh, the model was calibrated against water quality measurements obtained by monthly for one year. Um, these uh, model performance tests were used. Um, and uh, calibration was performed manually uh, with model parameters that were determined on the basis of the sensitive analysis results obtained. Uh, some examples of calibration graphs are given below. Uh, observation points where the stream doesn't flow and flow rate is determined uh, to be zero have been removed from the calibration as seen in the right graph. Um, the last step of study was uh, estimation of total maximum daily load. Uh, the, uh, this equation is sum of waste load allocation, load allocation, and margin of safety. Uh, waste load allocation is called some uh, point sources. Uh, load allocation is called uh, sum of the non-point sources. And TMDLs must be established with a margin of safety to take into account any lack of knowledge. The present and improvements laws given to the basin within the scope of the study are given in the graphics. The basin uh, is generally in the fourth water quality class. It was aimed uh, to reach the uh, third water quality goals for conventional parameters and enlightened goals for specific and priority pollutants in the submodels. The first three graphs show the point source laws, and the last graph shows the uh, non point. Uh, source laws. Uh, when the current uh, laws for point source are examined, uh, it was predicted that more loading can be made for uh, ammonium nitrogen, uh, nitrate nitrogen, BOD, um, cobalt, and PCB. When total phosphor was examined, uh, it has been determined uh, that no loads should be given uh, to the basin from point sources. As you can see in the non point source load graph, it was uh, seen that the load in the basin is high in the current situation for ammonium nitrogen, uh, nitrate nitrogen, and total phosphor, and it should decrease for the uh, middle water, middle uh, classification water. TMDL results uh, are shown in the table. Uh, according to the uh, results, it was seen that ammonium nitrogen, total phosphor, aluminum, and copper. Uh, uh, loads are high in the present and less loads should be allocated to this uh, basin for decreasing these parameters and pollutants. In conclusion, uh, it is evident uh, that strict measures are required to control discharge and prevent further uh, impairments. And modeling results suggest that even the drastic reduction in total nitrogen and not total phosphorus loads are not uh, sufficient to achieve water quality goals for downstream reeds of the uh, river. Uh, our study demonstrates also how to predict the uh, effectiveness of controlling these activities and identifying solutions specific to the watershed. Water quality models should be um, periodically updated with uh, new data. Thank you for listening. Uh, so our um, next speaker, Hudu Abdullahi, is also from Turkey. Hudu will speak to us about managing water for food and public health in a changing world with, uh, with the specific case of Somaliland. Hudu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. My name is Sada. I'm currently based in Turkey, studying on Doxmas University in civil engineering, especially hydrology. Um, my topic today will be how can we better manage water for food and public health in a changing world? Uh, case of Somaliland. Uh, Somaliland is located in a semi-desert area 
what's and we have also in the rainy season is but the water shortage have worsened in recent years especially uh, from 1981 up to 2019. Uh, only 52% of the population in Somaliland have access to a basic water supply. And usually in Somaliland, the main source of water is underground water, especially boreholes, shallowies, wellies, and also spring holes. Uh, water management for uh, uh, my topic, I. I did three types metabolic water management in public health, water management in uh, for food. Uh, firstly, water management was in relationship between water management and public health. Water has a profound influence of human health at a very basic level of minimum amount of water required for consumption on a daily basis of water. Uh, for a lack of fresh water, most, some, most of Somali regions use um, river water or unclean water. That's why a bub it, it, can, it can affect the, bub the public health to the community. And the first priority must be to provide access of uh, fresh water to the community. And however, access may be restricted by a low coverage, poor continuity, insufficient quality, poor quality, and access, excessive cost relative uh, to the ability of filling this to bay. And the, fir the, the first thing that causes to consume uh, uncleaner water is lack of, uh, lack of hydrological structures, lack of dams, lack of uh, catchments. That's why most of Somalis uh, drink um, river water. Uh, most uh, water management and food production. Uh, in Somaliland or in other regions in Somalia, and uh, also in African countries, agriculture is the most economic sector in for Somalis. Um, for low, less of water management or less of uh, hydrological structures can cause a reduce of agricultural products. And after the reduce of agricultural products, there must be a less of food production to the community. And that uh, causes severe of uh, Draft is also agriculture look is said to remain the biggest user of water in the middle of the of this century, while the shift of biofuels is generally welcome in general production could demand as well, water as fossil fuels. In terms of food, the volume of demand is growing with population expansion, and we are seeing a significant global move away from the main essential basis. And also I took this section, how to manage water in Somalia. And due to, due to the strong government uh, to the Somali countries, uh, the for uh, water is the most important thing to the life. And due to the less, due to the lack of, uh, lack of, lack of uh, any co strong community, uh, most Somalis can't have hydrological structures uh, like dams, and they haven't fresh water. Human activities and natural forces are reducing available of water resources, although a public awareness of the need for better control and production um, protection of water has increased over the past decade. Economic criteria and political consideration still tend to use water policy at all levels. Um, to manage water in Somaliland, uh, I took some of uh, some of uh, sectors were firstly blaming. Um, blame if, uh, if we as Somalis or Somalians, if we uh, blame uh, our rainwater, for example, yearly we take a lot of uh, rainwaters, but this water, some of them lost as evaporation, some of them goes to the oceans. So often to get drink water or fresh water, firstly we have to um, we have to structure hydrological structures, we are catchments, and, and secondly, effective and binding decisions can can be taken between institutions and the following coordinations national as a national water policy and um, basing um, basic water allocations 
water low registration diplomacy and determining the water, uh, modeling water resources and developing water quality standards and criteria, developing recipient water quality. Thank you. Thank you, Hodo. Thank you. This informative presentation about Somali lands. Our next speaker comes from uh, India. He is a PhD student at the Indian Institute of Technology in Kharagpur. I hope I pronounced not so bad. Um, it's Mr. Sri Tigor, and he will uh, talk to us about projecting IURC growth and associated impacts on hydrogeological process through scenario-based modeling a road ahead for sustainable future. Please, Mr. Uh, excuse me, it's Miss. Sorry, sorry for the mistake. Mr. I wasn't looking at my paper and not at the video. Mr. Tigor, please, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for providing me the opportunity to present my work. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all to my presentation. So today I'm going to present one of my PhD, uh, one of my objective of my PhD work. So the title of my presentation is Projecting Land Use Land Cover Growth and Associated Impacts on Hydrological Processes Through Scenario-Based Modeling. A roadmap ahead for the sustainable future. Yeah. So, in the, over the last several decades, India has experienced uh, significant land use land cover changes, and as a consequence of that, we are uh, facing uh, increase in urbanization, uh, deforestation, agricultural uh, expansion, and industrialization. Though the development of land resources may strengthen the economy for any nation, but simultaneously, it affects the sustainability of the natural resources. So as land use, land cover changes are dynamic in nature, so it is not always uh, possible to uh, like predict these uh, land use, land cover changes very accurately. So in this condition, uh, a scenario-based modeling or scenario-based analysis uh, has been recognized as a robust tool for understanding the mechanism of probable land use, land cover changes. So here, in the integrating different land use land cover scenarios in planning and management is gaining momentum for anticipating future uh, landscape different pathways and allowing, allowing uh, to explore different options uh, to reach the specific research goals. So uh, this is the methodology uh, we have used. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, monitored the historical land use land cover growth, and then we have used an integrated modeling system. So uh, to <coughs> predict the land use land cover changes. We have used a model that is a multi-layer perceptron Markov model. So it is an integrated model. So here, multi this multi-layer uh, perceptron is a, a neural network-based model. And that uh, usually deals with the spatial analysis of changes. And then we have combined this model with a Markov model that basically deals with the temporal assessment of changes. So here uh, we have used a, a software that is called Idrisi Selva. So in this software, this software, uh, this multi-layer perceptron model is inbuilt. So from here we have uh, estimated these land use land cover changes. And to simultaneously so to simulate the hydrological processes, we have used a distributed physically based model that is Mike Mike Hydro River. So Mike Shi model use Mike Hydro River model to simulate basically the uh, river flows. So this, in this model, we have used this uh, both. We basically use the interface of surface water and groundwater component. And here, uh, through this uh, multi-layer perceptron Markov model, we have generated the uh, probable future land use land cover scenarios. Uh, so uh, here I'm presenting these two of the scenarios that is business as usual and sustainable growth scenario. And overall, the simulation of the hydrological processes through uh, these scenarios has been performed by this Mike Shi and Mike Hydro River model. So our analysis has been performed on the Subarnarekha River Basin of Eastern India. So uh, this basin is a like <clears throat> is of very socio-economic importance, and it is uh, responsible for sustaining three India, uh, Indian states. So over the last few decades, the basin has subjected to deforestation, urbanization, and industrialization, and uh, basin is also very susceptible to the flash floodings. So that's why uh, with these consequences made the, uh, this case study very interesting. So uh, these are the results uh, which I have obtained from the uh, land use land cover modeling uh, for the historical period. So we have uh, done this for the four years. So the data we have obtained from the land set. So uh, for these year, we have uh, we 
we can see that there is a significant decrease in the forest area and the major transition up, uh, occur in from forest to the scrublands and there is a uh, significant increase in the built up area for the region and uh, uh, significantly increase uh, sorry decrease in the agriculture area takes place over this time so uh, here i'm going to define the land use land cover scenarios so we have used two uh, two scenarios first one is business as usual so in this in, in this case the history, uh, the future land use land cover is predicted uh, on the basis of an assumption that is it will follow the trends of the uh, historical land use land cover changes and next scenario that is a uh, sustainable growth scenario so uh, that that basically deals with the uh, sustainable development goal 15 that is life on the land so following this goal india has plan to bring one third of its land under the forest cover. So therefore our scenario aims at increasing the forest cover by 7% uh, because uh, in this basin, the overall forest area is 21%. Uh, so we here we are trying to uh, increase this area by one, one third uh, by 2030. So here are the results that obtained from the BAU scenario. So uh, like a historical land use land cover growth, it is also showing a increase, uh, a decrease in the forest area uh, and uh, increase in the scrublands and a decrease in the agricultural area and, and corresponding increase in the built up area. So uh, this presents the impact of uh, these land use land cover changes on different hydrological processes. So here I'm presenting the major hydrological processes that is evapotranspiration, overland flow, runoff and infiltration. So uh, these are the like annual water balance. So uh, as compared to 2011, we have used 2011 as a, a baseline period. So uh, due to significant uh, a decrease in the forest area, the, evapor uh, the evapotranspiration has decreased and uh, correspondingly due to increase in the built up area, that is urban area, the overland flow runoff and in increased and the infiltration decreased. So these are the results that, uh, that are obtained for sustainable uh, growth scenario. So as per uh, our initial assumption, so here the forest area has been increased. Uh, and the may in this transition takes place from scrub land to forest area uh, and the built up area has increased like in the bau scenario only so uh, these it is the this slide is presenting the impact of different hydrological processes on these land use land cover changes so due to increase in the uh, forest area the evapotranspiration here have increased uh, uh, with respect to 2011 that is baseline period and Overland flow has decreased and runoff has increased because of overall the urban area has increased. And again, due to increase in the uh, forest area, the infiltration has also increased. Uh, so these are the overall conclusion. So the predicted land use land cover under BAU suggests that would lead to expansion in the build up area, scrub line, along with a decrease in the dense forest and the agricultural line. And the finding obtained from the sustainable growth scenario uh, suggests that there, uh, if uh, if we follow this scenario, then it would lead to a reforestation over the basin. So these findings will help policymakers to frame better policies for the Subhan Rekha Basin of Eastern India. Now, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Shristi, for your uh, informative presentation. Uh, our two following speakers are also from India. Uh, so the following uh, presenter is uh, Parthi Kumar. Uh, he, he is from the River Revitalizing Rainfed agriculture network and he will speak to us about sustaining groundwater resources for stabilizing agrarian livelihood a case study of southwestern haryana please the floor is yours uh, many thanks many thanks Raya. uh good morning good afternoon everyone so so i will be making a presentation based on a research conducted in year 2018 2019 and it is it is talking about why it is important to like sustain the groundwater resources to stabilize the agrarian livelihood and it's a case study from southwestern haryana yeah so so the, uh, haryana is in a northern state of uh, india it's it's in a largely in alluvial plains and there is a district uh, within the haryana districts uh, Bhivani, and I will be. Uh, I conducted my research in that area. So there are largely the two objective of the of this research. It was trying to trying to find out what are the what are the factors that were leading to the groundwater depletion and what are the socio-economical implication. 
and in 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 the mix of though the, the mix of the two how the the depleting groundwater resources uh, have a longitudinal impact over the ecology and the livelihood if it is not tackled well so if if we look into the biophysical characteristics of this area and the human geography so there are the three things that can be usual to any geography that that is the, the the sort of the land and the soil type it's a semi arid area undulating topography and there are the scanty rainfall the here the annual rainfall is close to the 400 mm that is not quite low as compared to any any other state in the india but there are the some unique things that only uh, on, only found here and that's the globally unique one is there is a scattered and individual stick habitation so uh, nowhere else in the country or in the across the globe there you will find largely there are the clustered habitation people are staying together there are the villages there are the uh, hamlets and whatsoever but in this area there are the everyone staying at their individual farms so there is an, no sort of the the clustered habitation or a village formation also there is an uh, the reoccurring generational internal migration so people in this area to adapt with the water availability they are shifting their uh, shifting their house house or i will say the have the, the homes uh, every generation in, in adaptation to the Uh, to, to the uh, water availability so if if you look into a temporal story of this thing of the last 50 years uh, for time so there was in a time when this whole area was water scarce then there was the efforts made on the water resources particularly the groundwater development that takes place in area that made this area uh, water water positive or i will say water comfortability from water scarcity to water comfortability and in at present there are the water available but it's in the vulnerability because of the the, the groundwater depletion because every year against the recharge the withdrawal is for for four times so so the groundwater stage is around 400% so now there is a vulnerability and if future we it's not be tackled well there could be a disaster in the, in 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 this way so uh, during the study we took uh, took up the the village level uh, agrarian like agrarian patterns o- over the years so it largely started from the uh, 70s because that's the only time when the data was available with the village revenue officer so it was found in uh, found that during the kharif that is the summer crops uh, all the over the years of all the water intensive crops the area under the water intensive crops started increasing whereas uh, uh, in in the, the all all the rain fed crops particularly the millets they started uh, depleting the area under them is depleting so the the rain fed crops are uh, uh, so, sort of like replaced by the irrigated crops uh, s- same like the summer uh, in the in the winter season also all the all the nutrition risk crops like the the pulses and all these things that are also the water intensive so in this case it is the gram or the the the, the green pea we, what we call it 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 gets replaced by the the oil seed or the mustard so all the cash crops and the all, all the mainstream crops so what is its complicating implication was on the groundwater next so so in the same period of the time or roughly roughly for say in the the period of 40 to 45 years so groundwater depleted dry drastically uh, when the water level ground water level was close to 1 120 feet when it or, or, or i will uh, i will say say it's it's close to the uh, 40 meter now now it's uh, reached to 250 uh, 250 feet and uh, you can say it's close to uh, 80 meter or so so th- there is a 40 meter depletion in the in the this thing at the same time the number of tubes had increased and they drastically increased so that's the, they showed the when there was the accessibility people move towards the more water intensive crops but in that process when they become the the rich through the crop production and everything they become the resource poor and particularly groundwater resources poor in dealing with the groundwater depletion the community largely uh, largely the, their adaptive mechanism or the response was largely towards the supply side so they tried to enhance the supply more and more they increase the pump capacity they try to lower like go more deeper and deeper and, and Uh, not not on towards the demand side they hadn't made any significant change on the cropping pattern or the irrigation typology and all these things so the mix of all these things there are the two larger uh, the the implication that came out of this thing one is the economical because they have to adopt every time to the depleting uh, depleting ground water so they 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 have, they have to go with the higher motors higher submersibles and everything so they have the somewhat of its an uh, 
uh, it's it's economical but there is a social uh, this thing also there is a social implication also and that integrated with the caste system in india or you will you can say it's an, an largely and you can uh, see it through the class angle so the who have a larger land holding they diversified their livelihood through the earnings they get through the uh, the, the groundwater enhancement and over the years they migrated from the area and now when there is a, this area is resource poor it's largely dominated by by, by the the, the uh, lower caste what the the quotidly said as the lower caste or the lower class or the resource poor so it's have implication also there it's it, this area is very close to the thar desert thar desert uh, lies uh, like between uh, india and pakistan uh, Uh, Pakistan and so the, the there is a desertification happening here and the the, the, the desert are invading towards the alluvial aquifer because uh, over the time the groundwater uh, the ex, uh, the extraction had like uh, left the, the 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 I will say the land degradation happened and at a quite higher stage so now the two bigger chunk of the problem that this area is facing one is towards the ecological ecological sides that is uh, the to fight with the desertification and other is on the equity side that is the largely the socio economical or I will say largely in a social factors. So deal deal with this this problem or the the, the crisis there. There there could be an uh, three like uh, three possible interventions, and they can be seen together rather than in 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 the in the uh, silos. One of them is the engineering solution. So over that year, what happened? The traditional sources of this area they are the Johars. You can roughly assume them they are the ponds, the sort of an uh, one or two hectare area, the 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 sort of the this thing. So th their ponding area of one to two hectare. So the the the, the those area. they get neglected over the years when the, they have the good groundwater availability so now they need to be integrated integrated as in a sort of in a space for the recharge area also there is a need to demand side enhancement and also there is a higher need of regulation governance as i stated earlier the community here lives in the very scattered uh, individual uh, like uh, homes no habitation that hindered the collective efforts or the collective governance so these could be the uh, three possible intervention i will talk about all three in a like individual so on to the engineering solution or we, we largely say where we need to enhance the or augment the supply side so what we can the, the possible here the it lies in the yamuna river basin so yamuna water can be brought here during the flood flood times largely when there is no higher water demand in the river basin or the on on the uh, uh, i will say head area of the canal that water can be brought that can be then integrated with the traditional system and through the technical or the understanding the hydrogeology that can be then uh, uh, used as an artificial recharge and uh, it it without the this can be augment i will wrap in within the next minute one minute sorry for the time so on the demand side there needs needs to be go for the there is a lot of the unproductive irrigation there is a lot of the lot of the i, I will say Uh, unused or the misuse there so that need to be done on the governance side also there need to be an uh, interdepartmental uh, as well as the the uh, sort of the uh, multi stakeholder approach need to be taken here iwd rd is the nodal department uh, uh, irrigation the water resource department it need to be uh, indulged with the user groups or all sort of the users as well as it need need to be indulged with the all other stakeholder that are the philanthropists the researchers and the research organization and that's how the the, the sort of the uh, a co manage co management for the groundwater governance can be taken up here to sustain the ecology and the environment so so this is in a framework of the uh, we can say pr prospective intervention matrix where we can uh, achieve the efficacy uh, sorry e efficiency equity and the sustainability at the same time indulging all three things that the community and the program and the policies it, it can it can go go into the that uh, that collective sense of it that's all from my side many thanks hey, thank you patrick for uh, this uh, presentation about the complexity of managing groundwater in a sustainable way Uh, in a country uh, like india where groundwater is um, is a very important resource uh, the last speaker uh, dipika satya comes also from india from is an assistant professor at the department of environmental sciences university of jammu and uh, she will uh, talk to us about a gis based fluid fluoride contamination mapping of groundwater and explore the risk to the heli populace of the chenab river basin in jammu province 
please, uh, Deepika, the floor is yours, and please try to keep your time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I welcome uh, you all to my presentation on GIS-based fluoride contamination mapping of groundwater and its exposure risk to the hilly populace of uh, Chinab River Basin in Jammu province, North India. Uh, this is my, uh, the outline of the presentation. I'll be talking about what is the need for the study, objectives and study area, methodology, key findings and suggestions. So what was the need for the study? More than 200 million people worldwide, they drink uh, groundwater with fluoride concentrations greater than 1.5 uh, milligram per liter, which is the maximum permissible limit uh, set for uh, you know, uh, fluoride by World Health Organization. And in India, this problem is pro prevalent. Uh, the health effect of fluoride uh, taking up high fluoride concentration is fluoresis and uh, fluoresis it has reached alarming proportions in at least 19 states in India. Uh, around about 230 districts in India, they are endemic for dental and skeletal fluoresis and Doda district, the present area, uh, my area of study. In uh, Union territory of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, India is one of them. Uh, however, in JNK, uh, less than 30% districts, they are affected with fluoresis and uh, uh, endemic fluoresis in India is because of high levels of fluoride in drinking water sources and water supplies. Uh, the objectives of the study were to prepare, uh, you know, uh, to analyze groundwater fluoride contamination uh, in Chinab River Basin of Jammu province and to identify the most vulnerable areas and to prepare maps of contamination zones using GIS. So why uh, maps? Because map GIS uh, mapping, it helps to you to visualize and identify patterns that are difficult to see if uh, the data elements are in uh, table format and you can go for, you know, uh, taking up uh, uh, mitigation measures in uh, the areas where concentration of fluoride is more. And we also uh, went for the study of health risk associated with fluoride contamination in these areas. So this is my study area. Uh, this is Doda district. I have uh, uh, shown only one block of Doda district, which is uh, highly endemic for uh, fluoride contamination, although there are eight blocks. But this was the area where we found high levels of fluoride. So I have restricted my study uh, to this place only. Uh, and uh, this is a hilly area and people generally, they are dependent on uh, springs uh, for the, uh, meeting their drink, drinking water requirements. Or uh, in the lower reaches, we have a uh, few hand pumps also. And the elevational variation in this area, it is from 800 to 4,400 meters. Uh, we did, uh, we took uh, 66 water drinking water samples, they were collected and you know, water quality was determined, uh, including uh, fluoride contamination. And uh, we uh, took up the study for two periods, uh, pre-monsoon and post-monsoon, that is dry period and the wet period. And we analyzed uh, the parameters in field as well as uh, we uh, we had set up a temporary lab because there's no lab facility. It's a remote area. So a temporary lab was set for uh, analyzing other parameters. So these are the findings. We, uh, 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 as far as the water quality parameters were concerned, they were, uh, uh, we compared the results with national and international standards. And we found that some of the parameters uh, like pH, ele electrical conductivity, turbidity, uh, total alkalinity, uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, fluoride, and nitrate, they were uh, high as compared to the permissible limits set by World Health Organization and Bureau of Indian Standards. Uh, we tried to find out the water types because uh, we wanted to know why fluoride contamination was high. So we uh, uh, tried to find out the water types using Piper trilinear diagram. And we have found uh, the water types that have been shown in the uh, bar graph. Uh, when we compared it with the Gibbs uh, uh, mechanism governing groundwater chemistry, we found that most of the water composition was, uh, the, was due to a rock uh, dominance and not because of uh, you know precipitation or other factors. Now this is the map that we have prepared and we have found that one particular area is uh, 
uh, has high uh, groundwater uh, contamination of fluoride as compared to the other areas. Not much difference was observed during pre-monsoon and post-monsoon period. And most of the fluoride contamination in water was there in that particular area. And uh, the table shows what are the health effects on humans if the concentration uh, with the following concentration range. So the concentration range was greater than 1.5 uh, in the areas which have been shown in red. Uh, then we went for the uh, health effects study, uh, prevalence and severity of dental fluorosis. Uh, 200 respondents, they were called for visual evidence as well as we prepared certain uh, structured questionnaires, but only 125 agreed to get their teeth photographed and we uh, took help of a dental surgeon and we calculated a prevalence of dental fluorosis mm -hmm. in the area as far as uh, for the community as a whole, we calculated community fluorosis index. The formulas have been given in the slide. Uh, uh, so these are the different criteria which we have followed and we found that uh, uh, the mild category and your uh, moderate category, they were high as compared to all other categories, depending on uh, Dean's uh, fluorescence criteria. And as far as community fluoresces index was concerned, it was 1.76, which falls under medium uh, public health significance. Therefore, we need to take up measures to reduce water uh, ground uh, fluoride in groundwater. We also did risk assessment of fluoride and for that uh, fluoride uh, risk assessment was done using uh, daily expo uh, exposure to fluoride and we use this uh, estimation of daily fluoride consumption and uh, the following factors were used for calculating estimation of daily fluoride consumption. Uh, all these uh, uh, readings, they were taken in uh, through the questionnaire only. Then we calculated hazard uh, question, uh, and which is the non-carcinogenic risk of fluoride to human health. And it was calculating uh, calculated using estimation of daily fluoride consumption, as well as reference dose of fluoride, which was taken as 0 0.06 milligram per kg per day. Uh, and uh, we calculated the hazard question. And this was the map which was prepared based on hazard question. Uh, hazard question, if it is less than one, there's negligible non-carcinogenic risk. If it is greater than one, there is significant non-carcinogenic risk. Again, this uh, findings, these findings plus the groundwater contamination uh, level, they were highly correlated because uh, the area where groundwater contamination was high, those were the areas where uh, we found high uh, hazard question. So, uh, uh, and the readings, they were similar during your uh, pre-monsoon. Not much variation was observed during pre-monsoon and post-monsoon periods. Now, the key findings uh, of our study were that uh, Doda Block in Chinab River Basin has been found to be endemic. Although whole of the district is said to be in the, uh, endemic for fluoresis, but uh, we found that it was more concentrated uh, in Doda block. A uh, comparison of uh, calculated parameters with drinking water quality standards have shown elevated concentrations of parameters like pH, turbidity, TDS, TA, DO, fluoride, and nitrate. Therefore, this water needs to be treated before you know uh, public takes up uh, takes this water for meeting their daily requirements. Piper trilinear diagram has shown variable hydrochemical phases and uh, Gibbs diagram has confirmed fluoride contamination due to geogenic sources. When we compared it with the uh, geology of the area, we found that granite formations in the study area, they are most likely to deliver fluoride to the uh, groundwater. Uh, Doda block has high prevalence of dental fluoresis and falls under medium health significance category based on community fluoresis index. There is a potential non-carcinogenic health risk for the people getting their drinking water from springs and hand pumps in the study area. And we, uh, the study suggested a use of alternative surface water resources, particularly the streams that are there in the area, dilution of spring waters and defluoridation. We are working on uh, defluoridation using biological material of supply of water in the contaminated areas. And these are the uh, references and my acknowledgements to uh, Scientific and Engineering Research Board uh, for funding this study. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deepika, for uh, you. your presentation. So you reminded us that uh, groundwater sometimes can be naturally contaminated, not yeah. only by human uh, activities. Um, so uh, we have uh, in the Q&A box uh, 
we have uh, actually we had three questions. One of them was already answered by um, by Nil Su, and uh, you can read her answer in the Q and A box. And two other ones are there, so I uh, and, and they are addressed to a specific panelists. The first one is for Sri Tigor. Uh, the uh, person, the participant, Karishma, enjoyed the, your presentation and even says you have a lovely presentation. And the question is that as per your research, SG scenario can help in increasing forest area across basin area. How are we looking for a balanced mechanism in a way that this does not lead in snatching livelihoods of many adivasis and tribes settled in these low lying areas near basin? So Tristi, please, if you want to answer directly orally. Yeah, actually, I'm not able to uh, listen to the question. Can you please repeat it? OK, uh, you can read it actually in the Q&A box if it's uh, easier for ah, you. OK, OK, let me read it. Uh, now it appears in the, um, in the, as if it is already solved, answered, but uh, I don't see your answer written in the Q&A box. But, uh, I will uh, come back to you. So the other question in the Q&A box is to Debika and uh, the uh, participant Ahmad Majar would like to know the source of fluoride in the groundwater and is there any observation regarding the dynamic of fluoride to other locations? As far as uh, dynamics of fluoride in other locations, the study uh, was carried out throughout Jammu province and was not only restricted to the Doda area. We collected samples from all over Jammu province and we found that highest contamination level is there in uh, Doda area. So therefore, I have chosen only that particular area where uh, do, uh, your fluoride, fluoride contamination was high for this presentation. And as far as second part, I told you that uh, uh, when we compared it with the geology of the area, granitic formations were uh, found and they were held responsible for high fluoride uh, contamination in the area. Although we have collected the rock samples also, we are working on lithological uh, units also and we have sent the uh, rock samples for analysis. Uh, so uh, with Surety will be saying it only after we get the samples analyzed, but as of now, we think it is because of the granitic uh, formations. Because granite has very rocks, they are a, a typical type of uh, source of uh, fluoride uh, rich rocks, and they contain a fluoride ranging from you know 500 to uh, 1400 milligram per kg. So they can be possibly the reason uh, of uh, high fluoride in this area. In other part of Jammu province, we don't have these rocks. So I hope I have answered your query. Thank you. Thank you, Deepika. Uh, Shristi, are you ready? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, here we are following a government policy that leads to uh, like uh, reforesting has to be taken place on the scrub lands, uh, basically. So I think it will not affect the livelihood of, uh, as she asked, uh, of the uh, tribal settle in the low lying areas near the basin because uh, basically we are uh, just here planning to reforest the area that are uh, falling under scrublands okay i don't see uh, any reaction uh, i have i have from my side uh, two questions and since i don't see questions from the participants i will go ahead and ask them um, i would like to uh, uh, um, to go back to kennedy's uh, presentation and i i'm I uh, was very interested by your presentation because you brought in uh, the question of private, the private sector, the role of the private sector in the sustainable development goals. Usually we only speak about the, the public sector. So how do you see, I mean, you showed about the industry in Botswana, et cetera. So how do you see generally a role for the, pub, for the private sector in achieving uh, sustainable development goals? Either you can give me a general answer or if you have a specific answer perhaps more related to your study or on a, on a specific goal. Uh, thank you moderator for that question. Uh, I believe that uh, my concern or our concern was uh, also that uh, for this sustainable development uh, agenda to be achieved it needs all the actors to be um, active in driving the sustainable development agenda. Like right now it's like, it's a government uh, uh, responsibility or it's a government 
um, agenda or it's just for the regulators to do without actually the private sector really also committing and taking part into making sure that uh, the uh, national commitments are being achieved. So this study is actually trying to bring both the regulators and the business actors into play to actually also have a hand into actually driving the achievement of the sustainable uh, development, sustainable development agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kenya. Yes, I, I mean, I think uh, we should not always rely on the public uh, sector. Perhaps the private sector can have a role to play. So, meanwhile, um, we, we have another, uh, let's say, uh, question to Nilsu. If you can see the question, Nilsu, uh, from Ahmed Banjar from Syria. So he is interested in the initial and boundaries condition your works on by implementing this model. Uh, yes, uh, we measured uh, in uh, Kichukmendere River Basin uh, last year. They are measured um, uh, conclusion actually. Uh, and this is the first um, project uh, in this basin. So uh, he uh, answered, uh, he could, it is, this is my answer actually, because we, we use uh, the uh, measured or observed uh, data in this model. Okay, thank you, Nilsu. Um, there are still no other questions in the Q&A box. Uh, perhaps I, uh, we have time, we have still three minutes before uh, closing. Um, I want to ask a question to Hodo about uh, Somaliland. Because, I mean, as far as I know, Somaliland is still not recognized by the international com community, despite the fact that uh, the state exists now since 30 years, and I believe there are soon elections or elections has just happened. And um, so um, how is it, I mean, um, how is Somaliland seeing all these international agendas like the SDGs, and others that have uh, an effect uh, on uh, water resources. And are they looking at them that there's something they want to apply despite that it is, they are adopted by a community, international community that does not recognize Somaliland. And yes, if you can just uh, give us an idea about this situation. Uh, thank you, yes. And uh, firstly, Somaliland is an unrecognized country. And that's why we can't get uh, some needies, some community needies like uh, dummies, building dummies, like investment, international investment is because we are part of Somalia now. And the Somalia, they, they, they don't allow uh, so some international countries to invest Somaliland uh, and unless they need to take um, Somalia permission first, inshallah. But uh, we hope so. We are a strong country. Uh, we the last the last week we did uh, our election. Alhamdulillah, the election finished with peace. And um, inshallah, we will be recognized. Inshallah. Thank you. Okay, uh, not an easy uh, situation. Yesterday we had uh, a presentation about um, in this uh, under this sub team about uh, situations of uh, conflict, instable policies, uh, instable political situation uh, related uh, with in connection to the uh, development of the water resources sector. So I, I assume your case would would have fit also in this uh, case. Um, if there are no uh, other questions, or if one of the panelists uh, has something to say, oh, still, I see uh, uh, our active participant, Ahmad Majar, has dropped in a last minute question. So he is saying, I, I suppose he is uh, addressing Nilsu, uh, or, or perhaps it's only a comment to Nilsu. As you know, each model will be workable in the definite interval of conditions. So it is important and sufficient to present these conditions in national and boundary. And he is wishing you good luck, Nilsu. So it is was only yes. a Yes, thank you. 
Thank you. Final encouraging comment uh, for your work, Nilsu. Yeah. Um, so unless uh, one of the participants would like to say something. Okay, so I see uh, no reaction. So every uh, um, everyone is uh, is happy. And uh, now I will uh, close the session. I would like to thank all the participants for their very insightful and instructive uh, presentations on the various uh, aspects of uh, uh, better managing water for food and public health in a changing world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you, the participants. And thank you for the uh, technical uh, background.